Great, thank you. Well, thanks very much for inviting me. And yeah, it's been a long time since I was uh, last here in Marseille. It was actually a, a different building back then. Uh, so thanks for having me back, and thanks all for, for coming here for the, for the seminar today. So this is uh, joint work with uh, Gilles Duranton, uh, who I've been working with for a very long time, like basically as long as I've known uh, Federico, I think, <laughs> for <Yes. right? laughs> many, many years, since we were students uh, a long time ago, yeah. So um, it's a paper on the aggregate implications of uh, urban growth. This goes through. Just to not get stuck. Okay. So um, when we think about the relationship cities uh, between cities and growth, there's an obvious link growing from growth to urbanization, right? Because we know that in every country, as a country uh, develops and becomes wealthier, and, and, and um, there's a tendency for more people to live in cities and for cities to become uh, more populated as well. But there's also a link going in the opposite direction, and many people argue that cities themselves are an important engine of economic growth. So, uh, figuring out these channels, figuring out the magnitude of these effects is not easy because we really don't have like a, a ready set model that we could use for this. It's difficult to get aggregate implications out of existing urban models and simply just, you know, doing some kind of, of course, country regressions or so on, it's not going to get us very far, right? So what we do in this paper, just having trouble detecting this. So uh, what we do in this paper is to develop uh, a new model of how cities and the uh, aggregate economy interact. It's a model that, uh, to start with, tries to build on strong market foundations, for both the benefits and the cost of bigger cities. So in terms of the benefits, uh, there's a lot of literature indicating that uh, there are important uh, productivity benefits for firms and for workers from being in, in denser and bigger cities. And here we are going to have those benefits arising from human capital spillovers and some links between uh, human capital and entrepreneurship. But we're also going to be uh, uh, working with, with quite some detail on an aspect that has so far uh, had less de research devoted to it, which is the costs of bigger cities. Uh, and in particular, we're going to model the cost of larger city population through higher transportation and housing costs, but taking care to acknowledge a number of components that turn out to be important. First that there's a relationship between where you live in the city and how much you need to travel around. So if you live further away, you tend to, to travel more. Uh, second, the fact that urban transportation has an important time component and the value of that time is going to vary with economic development and growth. And that's going to be important for the dynamic effects. And finally, the fact that bigger cities also tend to be more congested, right? So I'll show you some equations about this later, and then we'll also have some empirical estimates going to this. So, okay, so this is, you know, there's more details there than usual in terms of the cost of bigger cities. Uh, but this idea that there are both benefits and, and costs of cities is sort of fairly standard. What is probably less standard is the way in which we resolve that trade-off here. So in urban models, in models of systems of cities where you have many cities of different sizes and we think of them as, as sort of the number and the size being, being endogenous, in those models it's quite standard to use a construct that goes back to work in the 1970s by Bernard Henderson from his PhD thesis uh, of having cities created by competitive developers. Sort of entrepreneurs who run a business of creating cities, they control all of the land in the city, they compete with each other. Of course, you know, this we know is not very realistic. There are not many cities that are fully controlled by one developer. Um, nevertheless, that mechanism gets used a lot because it has some nice properties. It's easy to use. Also, under some circumstances, uh, in particular, if there's not lots of heterogeneity across city sites, it's a, a mechanism that ends up delivering socially optimal outcomes. Um, however, we think that in many contexts, and in particular 
today in this paper, we're going to be focusing a lot on, on the US. There are many contexts where the size of cities, the population size of cities, is not necessarily optimal. And in fact, there's lots of arguments about uh, dipping attention between how much people who are already living in the city, uh, uh, incumbents, so to speak, um, about whether their interests are really aligned or not with the general interests of society or for other people who might come into the city, right? So we are instead going to resolve this trade-off between the benefits and the cost of bigger cities through a, a political economy mechanism that we're going to try to model in a simple way where there's going to be land use regulation that determines how much cities can grow. And that regulation is set by people who are already living in the city. So it's going to be chosen in the best interest, but not necessarily in the best interest of all the people who might want to come into the city, right? So this is going to be an important novel element of, of the model. Um, then there's going to be a, a second part of the paper where we do a couple of, of things. Uh, first, we are going to uh, try to match a number of important status facts that we know hold uh, for cities. And in fact, a lot of the theoretical exercise in, in writing down this model has been for us to go back and forth between the model and then trying to match magnitudes that you see in reality. And if we didn't match, figuring out what was missing and go back and put that ingredient into the model, right? So I'll highlight some of those aspects as we go, as we go along. But besides matching existing stylus facts, we're also going to generate some new facts, in particular facts associated with this process of land use regulation uh, that we're also going to show you holding data. The other data-driven aspect of the paper is going to be to use some of its key equations, some of the key equations of the model, to then take into the data and estimate some of the key parameters. And here, a nice aspect, I think, is that we can estimate the same parameter using different equations of the model. Right? So, for instance, we, can, we have a parameter that determines, uh, that starts off as a, an elasticity of travel needs depending on where you live in the city. So we can look at that equation and estimate that parameter. But then we can all go to the within city equilibrium and estimate that parameter again with different data. And then we can go to the full general equilibrium of the model and estimate the same parameter with a different equation and yet a different source of data. Right? So I'll show you all of those approaches give actually very similar parameter estimates, right? which give us some confidence on, on the numbers, but also on the way in which the model is working and aggregating all of this. Um, and then the final aspect of the paper is going to be to combine the model with those parameter estimates to then perform some counterfactuals. Counterfactuals on a couple of, of, of important questions, we think. One is to think about the effects of cities on aggregate growth and aggregate income, which was our initial motivating factor, but also given the uh, focus that we put on, on planning regulations, we're also going to look at the quantitative importance of those planning regulations in the context of the United States. So, of course, you know, given all of these ingredients that go into this and the, the combination of theory and empirical quantification, there's going to be a lot of literature that's related to this. I guess the main strand of literature related to this is the literature of what's called the Sinus literature that was, you know, started by, by Henderson back in the 1970s. And in particular here with the uh, this paper in the Journal of Political Economy by Black and Henderson back in 1999, um, with a few differences, right? So we're going to, uh, they, they work with uh, human capital uh, as the sole determinant of growth. Here we're also going to have, in addition to that, change in transportation cost and also city productivity shocks. Uh, this combination of things is also going to allow us to uh, uh, connect two strands of urban growth models that, except for this paper by Rosie Hansberg and Wright, have so far been disconnected, which are systematic growth models where we think about growth in cities coming from some fundamentals and random growth models where that growth comes simply from random shocks, right? And the focus of the two literatures has been quite different. The systematic growth literature has looked at really what determines the growth of cities. 
the random growth literature focuses more on trying to get realistic synthesized distributions. Here we're going to try to do both things at the same time. Um, the difference is that instead of having symmetric cities, as it's common in those models, we are going to have two sources of heterogeneity. We're going to have heterogeneity in terms of underlying productivity of these locations, but also we're going to have geographic heterogeneity in terms of barriers to urban expansion. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you how that works in more detail in a moment. Finally, this new approach to the deformation that I mentioned, incorporating regulation and the tension between incumbents and, and e-commerce, right? So that on the theory side, of course, uh, a large literature uh, looking at the benefits and the cost of cities. Uh, that literature has mostly focused on the benefits side. So there we're going to be fairly standard, but in fact, we are going to end up redoing for the US some work that Jorge de la Roca and, and I did a, a, a few years back on uh, using Spanish data in a particular in our, in our study. Uh, and then finally, you know, related to uh, quantitative models of multiple cities, there are not that many, uh, but here's, you know, actually this, this, these three examples of that. And in fact, some of the counterfactuals that we do are going to be most closely related to this recent paper by C.N. Moretti, thinking about the consequences of land use regulation for U.S. Uh, cities and, and welfare. Okay, any, any questions before I jump into the model? Okay, so let me go in. Um, we are going to have an urban growth model, so of course we need a dynamic model, we need time. Time is going to be discrete, we're going to index that by, by T. Then we have a continuum of potential sites for cities, indexed by I, but not all of them are going to be used. So some sites will have a city, some sites will be vacant. The sites differ along two dimensions. One is underlying productivity, so this capital A, I, T, denotes the productivity of site I at time T, and that's going to be varying over time. And then we also have this uh, geographical constraint to develop, indexed by, by Z. I'll explain in more detail in a moment. Um, so, of all of the sites, which ones get populated, how big they are, how many people they have, the size of those cities, they're all going to be endogenous. It's also going to be endogenous what is the size of an alternative rural sector. And we're also going to let population in the whole country above, uh, uh, you can think of it as, as happening through international migration, uh, mostly. Okay, so in terms of the timing, uh, we're going to have a, a simple overlapping generation structure where people live for two periods. In the first period, their children just living with their parents. Uh, then in the second period, they become adults and they can choose either to stay where their parents used to be or to move elsewhere, okay? So this structure is simply to put some mechanism that makes some people incumbents in a location, right? So you're basically an incumbent in a location if you grew up there with your parents and then you inherit a house from them, right? And that puts you in a different situation from someone who move, wants to move in from somewhere else. Okay. So uh, then in each period, we have the following sequence of events. First of all, the adult generation of the previous period passes away, their children become adults, they have one's offspring in. So then we get the underlying productivity of each location gets updated by a shock. So if A I T minus one, is the productivity of the location I in the previous period T minus one. Then the productivity in the current period is that all period productivity multiplied by this shock GIT, which is ID. Um, then seeing that uh, productivity update, incumbents, so people who grew up in the city, um, and uh, they decide on what level of planning regulations they want for the city. And you can think of this planning regulation simply as sort of a, a nuisance cost, right? So these are things about floor to area ratios or uh, minimum lot sizes. So lots of rules, you know, like, or you need permission from all of these boards or lots of things that are going to make it more costly to build a house in the city. So by making these costs higher or lower, they're effectively going to affect the cost of housing for new people coming into the city, 
So indirectly, they're also going to be choosing how lords they want their city to become. Um, yeah, one, so uh, up to Pirata has a yeah. point 0.9 or point 0.8, sometimes a little drop. Yeah, so we, so there are two reasons why we don't do that. The first one is we're thinking about the context of the U.S., where uh, given the overall growth in, in total population, even places that are doing relatively badly compared to the cities, like, say, Detroit, if you look at downtown Detroit, there's been some, some shrinkage, but if you look at the whole metropolitan area of Detroit, there's actually been, been a slight increase. So it's been very small compared to the cities, but even there, you know, within this you know, one generation, the city still grows a little bit, right? So there's, there's first of all, an empirical motivation. But that's also, you know, theoretically, just much easier because uh, I guess one of the uh, interesting aspects about cities is that there's really an asymmetry between positive and negative shocks, right? And that's interesting in itself, but it's also difficult to handle because if you think about a positive shock, well, if you get a positive shock in a city and the city grows, you just build more housing. But if you get a negative shock, you don't destroy housing, right? The housing remains there, right? So think about what happens when you get a negative shock and uh, some of those houses may be deteriorating because they're not kept up, those things, uh, would force us to think much more about uh, durable housing, where those houses are left, where exactly they are in the city. So it becomes more complicated. So we're going to abstract for that, but partly also because of the empirical motivation. But yeah, it's, it's a... It's, it's, thanks for, for noting that. Yeah, it's an important aspect. Yeah? We're going to think about different magnitude of shocks, but in, the, in all cases, positive shocks. <clears throat> so then, seeing this evolution of productivity, seeing the cost of planning regulations in different cities, people will decide where they want to live. And they can stay either where they grew up or they can move somewhere else. Or if, you know, if the population is increasing because of international migration, these new migrants also will need to choose where to locate. So if they move to a new city, they need to get a house there. And that involves incurring this cost PIT of planning regulation. So that's P for planning. And then bidding for one period lease on one plot of land in their, their city. Okay? And then you know, people accumulate human capital. Uh, I'm going to talk about that next. A commute, receive income, consume housing, number, etc. Okay, so human capital accumulation. Here, human capital is accumulated in three steps. The first step is compulsory education. Everyone gets this. And compulsory education basically gives you the same level of human capital that the previous generation got after further education, right? So, you know, for simplicity, it's as if, as if you know, secondary school today gave you what university gave you yesterday. Okay, so this is just going to create some uh, growth of human capital over time, where each generation builds on the level of human capital of the previous generation. But then, in addition to this compulsory education, people can get further education. And how much further education they get, it's their choice. Okay? So they, they have, uh, in their adult life, they choose what sheer delta they want to devote to further education. And then they work the rest. And this raises a human capital to this level. Okay, so H bar T is what they got after compulsory schooling. Then it gets multiplied by this B of delta, where delta is how much time they choose to devote to further education. And this function B just tells you how much you learn, depending on how much time you spend doing that. The third aspect of the human capital, the third step of the human capital accumulation process is uh, human capital accumulated on the job. In particular, you know, motivated by, by some literature in urban economics, and in particular closely linked to this uh, earlier paper of mine with Jorge de la Roca in, in our study in 2017. In that paper, uh, we show that you know, tracking workers over time and looking at their earnings, we estimate uh, some earnings regressions that we're also going to do here today with US data. And what we do is, because we have the full uh, history of workers' uh, jobs uh, throughout different firms, but also throughout different cities, we can assign a different value to experience depending on where you get it and depending on where you use it. And what we show is that one year of experience accumulated in a big city, say in Madrid, we're doing that with Spanish data, is much more valuable than a year of experience accumulated in, say, Seville, a middle-sized city, and that, in turn, is bigger 
uh, more valuable than experience that can live in a smaller place. Not only that, but you know, if you then relocate to a different place, that greater value of experience you take with you, right? So you still get that more value, uh, even if you go to a smaller place, right? So, yes. Due to a selection effect, only good guys. No, so, when they... so in that in that paper, what we do is we estimate an earnings regression with a city fix effect, worker fix effects. We have the full panel, right? So, um, in fact, when you look at the distribution of, of fixed effects, if you assign a different value of experience to different places, the distribution of fixed effect is very similar across uh, cities of different, of different sizes, right? So what the results seem to be indicating is not that people in bigger cities are more productive to start with, it's that they become more productive because they are bigger cities and they accumulate a different kind of experience in those places, okay? So it's not that, you know, the best doctors or the best lawyers were necessarily uh, uh, initially in these places, is that those that started working in these places got more valuable experience and they became more productive as a result. Okay, so that's, that's at least what's coming so out. So the distribution is shifting up. Yeah, so the distribution, yeah. So we, are, well, we because we have this worker fixed effects and, and this panel data, the worker fixed effect guy is going to capture whatever is, you know, intrinsic and time environment about those workers. And then the uh, uh, experience uh, parameters are going to capture whatever is specific about, you know, coming from, from the different different locations, right? So if you don't take that into account, if you don't have, if you don't allow the value of experience to vary across cities, then the distributions of work effects effects look quite different. But this is because this value of experience then gets put into the work effects effect. Once you allow experience to be valued differently, then the, effects of, the fixed effect distributions become very similar. Yeah. Sorry, related question. Um, so the um, productivity depends on the uh, city where it is acquired here. So coming from Madrid might lead to higher productivity than having uh, work experience uh, elsewhere. But is it also that having the productivity uh, acquired by experience in one city affects the productivity in that city, or is it something general, like it's better to have experience in Madrid, to work in Madrid, than to work in other cities here? So in, in the model, to keep things simple, people are just going to choose location as adults want, right? So they, they grew up somewhere with their parents, and then when they become adults, they make a choice for the rest of their life. Okay, so this is to keep things simple. Empirically, where people obviously can move many times, what we find in the data is that this additional value of experience in Madrid is very similar in Madrid and in other places, right? So it's almost equally valued when you go elsewhere, right? So um, in fact, you see that very, very strongly, right? So yeah, we, yeah. Sorry, I'm confused about notation, but J is not the place. Not the no, J, J is a person here. Right, so so this is just because it is an individual, an individual choice. Yes, so um, the compulsory education is the same everywhere. Uh, further education is a choice, but uh, people are going to choose, you know, uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, basically, you know, you, 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 get, you get like a, like a, like a constant rate of human capital accumulation. And then you get extra value of experience, which depends on, on the size of the city where you get it, right? So in the end, yeah, so in the end, everyone in the same city has the same level of human capital, but there might be some differences in human capital across cities. Yeah. Sorry, maybe I have a question going back to experience, but I was thinking that maybe in a, a city with best fundamentals, there would be a selection of best employers that would uh, then look for best employees. So in that sense, there would be a sort of selection of, a, but of course, I mean, that's not what you find in that paper, but couldn't it also be a force of selection to our best city in terms of employees and employers? No. Uh, could be, could be. So, um, I mean, here we, we have lots of ingredients in the model. I think if you think about the two key things that we're living outside our modeling, uh, one is physical geography across cities. So we're going to model the geography within cities, but we're not going to think about where cities are located with respect to each other. The other aspect is sorting. Right, so here, everyone is the same, and we're not going to be thinking about this kind of sorting. Right, when we've done earlier empirical work, we've 
worried a lot about this kind of, of sorting issues, right? Um, on the uh, on the worker side, once you account for this kind of a different experience of different cities, you don't see big differences in terms of uh, say worker fixed effects distributions, as I was mentioning earlier. Uh, more recently, um, um, we we investigated a bit that right. So. Um, because it's a bit of a puzzle, right? On the one hand, when you look at these benefits of bigger cities in terms of uh, earnings for workers, you do find that the effects are heterogeneous. So more able workers, to say, as, as, as captured by the work effects effect, do seem to get bigger benefits. So you might expect them to sort into bigger cities, but then you don't see that kind of sorting, right? So we, we were trying to look at why is that the case. So we have a recent paper using US data where we can measure, we have measures of people's ability but also their self-confidence with the idea that when people are young, they may have a, an incorrect idea about how good or how productive they really are. And when we find in that paper, uh, which is coming out in, in, in DIA, uh, I guess early next year, uh, that is a paper where in the US data, we find that people sort by, not by how productive they are, but by how good they think they are. So they sort in terms of uh, self-confidence rather than, than, than ability. And then once they've sorted out, they've made some investments into the city, and if it's a big mistake, they tend to correct it. But if it's a small mistake, they tend to stick with what they've chosen before. Right? So that's part of... So, so it's a topic we've, we've thought about and we've worked on, but it's not going to be part of what's here today. Okay? So there, there's not going to be much of sorting. But you're right, it's an important, it's an important topic. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so... Um, yeah, as I was mentioning just a moment ago uh, when replying to, to Federico, uh, this, is, uh, this is in the end what you get in terms of human capital and GTI time t is going to be the same for everyone in the city and it's going to be something that increases with city size. <clears throat> then, you know, um, we, uh, in the paper, we have some detailed micro foundations about where this agglomeration benefits, where this advantage of bigger cities might be coming from. Here, uh, for the purpose of the presentation, and just not to spend too much time on this because it's more standard, I'm just going to show you the equation that we get in the end and tell you a bit where it's coming from. Okay, so this is the level of income per worker in CTI time t, which is basically total output divided by, by population. Um, and that depends on the underlying productivity of the city, depends on the level of human capital per, uh, uh, per worker in the, cent in the part that is common across cities, and also depends on city population, partly because of this, partly because we model um, some benefits of human capital, some human capital splovers arising through a connection of hum between human capital and entrepreneurship, right? So the way we do that in the paper is by, you know, first of all, starting from the fact that bigger cities will concentrate more human capital. And in the model, uh, how many ideas you get to generate new firms, uh, the amount of entrepreneurship that you get in a city, also depends on human capital. So uh, bigger cities with more human capital will generate more entrepreneurship, and there's going to be some cost elasticity of institution production function where there's some gains from variety, so that's going to generate some kind of aggregate. Uh, benefits from uh, uh, bigger cities, and those are going to be get amplified by this extra value of experience in bigger cities. So the sigma is this component arising from human capital spillovers and the connection with entrepreneurship, and the beta parameter is the bit that comes from this uh, greater value of early job experience. Uh, here, what's key is simply that we have this kind of agglomeration economies. There's a big literature in urban economics documenting them, quantifying them with actually very, very stable uh, estimates for those kinds of, of effects. Uh, many alternative mechanisms for getting this. Uh, in fact, Gina and I have an old handbook chapter where we go, work through a, a number of models that generate similar kinds of expressions to this one. But instead of spending more, more time on the, on the benefit side, let me devote a bit of time to the cost side of bigger cities because I think this, this part is, is a bit uh, it's a bit newer, okay? So um, here we are going to think about 
land in the city as extending along the positive wheel line. Only a segment of that line is going to get, uh, is going to be inhabited at any point in time. Um, I mentioned before that there are two dimensions of heterogeneity across cities. First, in terms of this underlying productivity that I've already talked about. The second is about these geographical constraints, right? So when we think about the geographical constraints, the way we model it is by thinking that there are some parts of the city where you can build housing and some parts where you cannot build housing because they're covered by water, it's very steep terrain, there's some barriers that prevent you from uh, building in those places, right? So, you know, if you think about this in practice, uh, today we're going to be working with US data for this paper. So this picture, you know, you have here uh, Los Angeles and San Diego and uh, Las Vegas. Um, so, you know, Los Angeles is a nice example of how constrained uh, some big US cities are in terms of being able to expand. So obviously, you know, if you try to expand this way, you can because you fall into the, the Pacific, right? But if you want to expand inland, it's also very difficult because, the, the, you know, the, the, whatever we've colored here in this sort of beige color is land that is 50% slope or steeper. Right, and you can see that kind of very steep land is already almost hugging whatever is already built up in, in LA, which is in red here. And then the green is uh, uh, federal parks and state parks and land that's permanently protected from development. Right, so there's actually very little space for LA to grow. Uh, other cities, you know, Nevada, you have a bit more space. If you look at this, the country, many cities have much more space. Right, so there's a big, there's big heterogeneity in terms of how cities can expand. Um, this aspect is something that was not in the paper initially. It's something that we've introduced in the, in the, in the revision uh, at the request of one of the referees, but it's actually something that turns out to be quite useful, right? And, and what you'll see later that actually it provides some insights about the way in which this natural land scarcity created by geography and the artificial land, uh, land scarcity created by regulation is going to give us some insights about the way in which those interact. That are going to be, I think, quite interesting. Okay, so then, um, to keep things simple, we're going to have uh, fixed size dwellings. Uh, and then, transportation is going to be uh, given by the expressions here. Okay, so this, you know, it's not very complex. We have three parameters there. But it's something that, in terms of writing the model, took, it, took us a bit of time to arrive at because we wanted to keep something simple. Uh, so we didn't have, we didn't want to have more parameters than we needed, but we also wanted to match a number of magnitudes at the micro level, at the macro level, right? So in the end, it turns out that this are the, you know, we, we actually need the, all of these three parameters that are there. Okay, so let me tell you what they are. The IT of X is the travel costs, uh, daily travel costs from going, you know, from home to work and back, of a person living in city I at time T at a distance X from the city center. So x to the power of gamma is how much this person needs to travel. Okay, so this tells you that people who live further away from the city center need to travel more. But unlike in simpler, say, monocentric city models, where that gamma would be equal to 1, people don't really all travel to the center and back, right? They tend to travel longer if they live further away, but not with an LCD close to 1. In fact, that LCD is going to be much, much lower than 1. That's the first aspect that we need to take into account. Then, if this is the distance traveled, tau it is the cost of traveling per unit distance. And that cost is in turn given by this expression. So, this uh, cost of traveling per unit distance has two components. One component that is common across cities, but has this T sub-index, so it varies over time. And this allows us to incorporate changes in transport technology, but more importantly, it allows us to incorporate changes in the value of travel time. Travel has an important time component, and that time is costly. Initially, we didn't have this parameter. We only had the other two, right? And then we worked with the model, and then we said, okay, so let's see how fast cities are growing in our model for any given level of growth of income per capita. And our cities were going way too fast, like an order of magnitude too fast. And then we realized what was happening. 
right? If you don't have this tau t, if you don't let the value of travel time increase over time, then as the economy grows and people become wealthier, if the value they assign to the travel time does not increase with income, then travel costs will become less and less important. So cities will start growing very, very fast, which is not in reality, right? So it's important to incorporate this rising value of travel time, right? A uh, second component of this expression is this function of city size, where we have city population to the power of theta. And this is capturing the fact that bigger cities tend to be more congested, so travel is lower in these places. Okay, and then, so, so we'll come back and estimate all of these parameters uh, later on. Um, so now we have this benefits of bigger cities, we're going to have some cost of bigger cities arising from this uh, transportation and housing, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, to close the model, we need a couple of things. First, we need to also uh, incorporate the rural sector. And the reason why we add a rural sector here is because, uh, to be realistic, we want to allow not just the size of individual cities to grow over time, but also the size of the whole urban sector to grow endogenously over time. And for that, we need some alternative rural sector, right? So we're going to have that. It's going to be a relatively simple sector where, you know, you can think of this simply, this would be like a Cap Douglas production function with agricultural land and, and labor uh, that would give you this kind of expression. Yeah. So, yes, in the previous um, slide, so instead of tau t, that's exactly what you want. Uh, not exactly, because the elasticity of travel time with respect to income uh, is is close to one, but it's it's not quite one. But yes, in fact, in fact, what so we the way we do this and we take when we take it to the data is we estimate all of the other parameters. We back out from what's happening with the evolution of cities, to what's happening with tau t, and then we back out what is the elasticity of uh, uh, the value of total time with respect to income. That, that will give, and it's very close to what you say. So it's not quite one, but it's like 0.96, something like that. Okay, uh, but instead of making that directly, we leave it as the three parameter and let us the data tell us what it is, and it's almost what you say. So it's almost, almost an elasticity of one with respect to income, not quite one, but it's like 0.9 something, which actually aligns quite well with the travel literature. Okay, yeah, but you're right. Yeah, that's, that's what. That's the way to think about it, right? In fact, you know, you would also incorporate here changes in travel speed, say because of technology. But in fact, when you look at the data in the US in recent decades, there's been basically no change in travel speed. And then what's left is what you say. It's only the velocity with respect to income. <clears throat> OK, so then we can start solving this. And um, yes? You didn't write the preference of the agent. I didn't write the preference. This was one of the, so I'll show you the consumption in a moment, right? Um, I, uh, you know, I, I went fast over this. I didn't explain why I was doing this, but um, when we introduce housing, um, you know, we, we, we had these fixed size dwellings, right? That is actually going to allow us not to have to specify uh, preferences, okay? Because basically you have two goods here housing and a numeric good, because housing itself is the same size for everyone, uh, then uh, all that people care about is given that their house is the same as everyone else's, they just care about how much they consume of the, of the numeric good, right? So we can, utility here is going to be equivalent to consumption of the numeric, right? Also because you are discussing about those costs and it's not really clear to me the travel costs, whether those are coming from preferences because when I'm using my time to travel and mm -hmm. I'm going to that or it's because it's we are living in the city, it's more crowded and therefore it takes me more time to move to the it's got more costly for me to move from one point to another. So it's all together, right? So when we think if you think about the so if you live in a city, if you live far away, uh, then that's going to make you have to travel for longer distances, then also uh, bigger cities are going to be more crowded. So for the same distance, you're also going to spend more time in the car 
That's because it's going to be more congested, right? So all of those aspects are there. Um, it's entirely possible to do the model, you know, specifying some specific references, right? You only need to do that if you uh, make housing heterogeneous, which we can do, right? If you make housing heterogeneous, you get two additional effects. One is, uh, as you'll see in a moment, what's going to happen in this model, any kind of model like this, is going to be that places that are close to the city center, because people need to travel less there, are going to be more valuable because they have better accessibility. So they're going to be more expensive, right? So here, the way we set up the model, it's quite simple. People who live close to downtown, they pay a lot for the housing, they commute little, okay? People who live further away, they need to commute more, but the housing is less expensive, right? There are two margins of adjustment that we're not exploiting here. One is that people, in response to this uh, lower price of housing further away from the center, will tend to have bigger houses. So they will have small flats downtown, bigger houses in the suburbs. And then the construction industry, given that land is also going to be less expensive in the suburbs because of this lower price of housing, will also build in a different way. So you think of housing as being built with capital and land, where land is less expensive, they will have a lower capital to land ratio. So you will tend to have tall buildings downtown, and you have shorter buildings with bigger gardens in the suburbs, right? Now those are effects that, are, that will be there naturally. They're effects that we know well from the monocentric city model, say, right? And they don't that a lot here, right? So we could do that. The model will work similarly. We'll just complicate expression slightly. We'll get, but the, the only insight that we'll get in addition would be these two extra margins of adjustment. Okay. But in terms of your intuition about what's going on here, it's both things, right? So it's the fact that in a, in a big city, on average, I need to travel more, but also that travel tends to, tends to be slower because of congestion. So those effects are there. Okay, so now if we think about, yeah, this trade-off I was mentioning of where you live in a the city, then, uh, just what I said a moment ago, so people living close to downtown, uh, very good accessibility, short commutes, but in, as a result, the place where they live is going to be very valuable for them and for everyone, so it's going to be more expensive, right? So you have this trade-off. Now, this trade-off is not, obviously not something new. It's something that's been there for a long time in urban models. In fact, if you think about the classic monocentric city model of uh, Alonso and, and, and Muth and Mills, you know, people talk about this gradient that you get from that model a lot. But I think something that gets emphasized a bit less is what I think is, is probably the key insight of this model. And that is, you know, what, what's often called the Alonso Muth condition, right? So the fact that given that you have this greater accessibility downtown, then as you approach the city center, any improvement in accessibility should be exactly offset by a change in housing costs, right? So in fact, in equilibrium, this elasticity of travel needs with respect to distance to the center, gamma, should also be the elasticity of housing costs with respect to distance to the center, right? So when we get to the empirics, we're going to go and check that, right? Okay, so then, you know, what this means is that within each city, costs will involve different combinations for different people of housing and transportation. But the sum of those two components is going to be the same for everyone, right? Because here, basically, everyone in the same city is identical. They end up you know, having the same, the same utility, the same level of consumption. It's only that the cost of the living in the city will vary from one person to another in terms of the components, not in terms of the overall magnitude. The sum of transportation costs and housing costs it's going to end up being the same for everyone in the city, and it's going to be given by this expression here. That is an increasing function of population with these components, gamma and theta, that come from the transport uh, technology that I gave you before. Uh, and then these are the benefits of bigger cities that also, you can see here, are a function of city population, here with the exponents, sigma and beta. Okay, so this is, if you think about... Um, the consumption level for an incumbent, someone who grew up in a city, uh, then it's going to be uh, given by this expression here, which has a positive component associated with population, 
and a negative component, right? So when you think about this expression, um, that's going to give you something that looks like this, okay? So if you think about consumption for incumbents as a, as a function of city population, it's going to be something that first increases and then decreases within the population. Sorry? Yes. Um, so the, the weight that the incumbent gives to the benefits of urbanization and to the cost of urbanization is basically the same. While we could imagine that um, given preferences of uh, the incumbent, he might weight these two differently and that could be potentially captured when you estimate the model, right? Yes, so um, the trade-off is going to be different for an incumbent than for, say, a social planner, okay? So here, if you think about incumbents, they will think, well, you know, starting from a, a, a low level of population in the city, as this increases, the benefits of agglomeration more than outweigh the cost of congestion, but eventually congestion takes over. So from my own individual point of view, as an incumbent in the city, ideally, I would want the city to be of this population size. How do I achieve that? Well, together with the other incumbents, I get to choose the level of regulation in the city. So say the level of consumption that people get in the best alternative in other city, in the rural sector, is given by this city. Okay, so then what I do is to choose a level of regulation that creates an additional cost equal to this height. So that means that for me, as an incumbent in the city, I get to enjoy this full level of consumption, but someone who comes in the city for the first time and needs to incur this cost of regulation to build a new house, they need to subtract this cost of regulation, and they're actually left indifferent with respect to another city at this level of population. So in that way, by setting regulation, I can choose how much uh, population I want in my city. But you're absolutely right. That trade-off, that point they choose in the trade-off by incumbents is not going to be necessarily the one that someone else would choose, in particular the one that a social planner would choose, right? A social planner would look at this, sorry, and they say they would look at a, a different city, say city two. The city two is like city one, but only le no, same geographical constraints, simply uh, lower productivity. That has this lower population size and two. And then a social planner would look at this and say, well, sure, if I somehow manage to get more people into city one, incumbents would be slightly worse off. But people coming from elsewhere you know, they would certainly prefer to be in city one than in city two because this place is more productive. So a social planner would actually want to bring more people into the most productive cities uh, than incumbents want, right? So this is, this is going to create this tension and it's going to create some inefficiency of regulation here. And then you're right, we can actually look at this in the data and try to figure out what is that cost regulation, right? So that's one of the exercises we're going to, we're going to be doing later on. Okay, so um, then, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, and not every city site is going to get populated. Only the, you know, so the most attractive overall are going to get populated. What an attractive city site is, is not straightforward. It's going to be a combination of productivity and geographical barriers. But we show in the paper that that's an in, a sufficient summary statistic for a city's attractiveness is the price of housing at the city center. So in fact, consumption for incumbents in the city is going to be proportional to city center house prices. So in effect, in maximizing their consumption, this incumbent set regulation as if they were trying to maximize the value of their house. Um, then, you know, just to, to see briefly how the model works, um, I mean, this diagram that you see here is simply a depiction of the equilibrium of the model uh, calibrated for the United States in 1980. And the way I'm representing it here is a way that looks, I guess, similar. If, if you, you know, for those of you who are into international trade, you might recognize this as something that looks like the specific factors diagram, right? So when we do a specific factors model international trade, we typically have two sectors. This is the, you know, we, when we typically teach trade, we teach students about the the gains from trade, and then we do comparative advantage, 
and the Ricardian model with a single factor. And then we say, fine, so they're gains from trade, but not everyone wins from trade. So we need a model that shows that some people might gain and some people might lose. For that, we need a couple of sectors. So we typically have a sector, uh, you know, we have one sector that we represent from left to right, a sector from right to left, and then we make these two vertical axes here. The distance here is going to be total employment or total population, right? And we look at how we allocate it across sectors. So this diagram looks very similar to that. This red curve here is, in fact, the rural sector, and this simply is from this production function with decreasing returns to labor. The urban sector here is more complicated <coughs> because it's actually made up of many different cities. These gray curves that you have here are like the curves I showed you before for different cities, right? So this would be like for New York and for LA and so on. And uh, then in each of the cities, incumbents set a level of playing regulations that allow you to allow them to uh, keep consumption at the maximum of this curve, right? So then this black schedule that you see here is actually consumption for incumbent residents in each city as you go from, you know, uh, New York and LA and Chicago and so on, right? Um, and then cities get populated up to some marginal city here where people are indifferent between being in that city and being in the rural sector. And then sites that are beyond that, they remain empty because then you wouldn't be able to get a uh, consumption that would be as high as in the alternative rural sector. Then if you think about the economy over time, well, you know, if you think of going one generation up to, say, 2010, one thing that's going to happen is there's going to be lots of migration into the U.S., so overall population is going to increase. So we need to separate these uh, two vertical axes horizontally, right? So we're going to have them have total population in the country expand. But also, human capital is getting accumulated, and then we also get this productivity shocks to different cities. As we were discussing before, some of them are going to be tiny, some of them are going to be big, right? So now we have all of these curves going up. Uh, so at the same time, we have total population increasing. So the rural sector grows, but grows less disproportionately, right? So we get an expansion overall of the urban sector in the US, more urbanization. Also, every city grows in population. Some grow very, very little, like Detroit. Some grow a lot, okay? You can see, you know, uh, uh, some cities get closer to each other, so you can see the gap between New York and LA uh, shrinks uh, uh, here. Uh, also, the other cities change it, so Dallas, for instance, overtakes Detroit and so on, okay? So this is just showing how, how the equilibrium here is working. So, so you, you know, but then people living in the countryside are lower utility than the, the one living in the city. People in the countryside have the same utility as the marginal resident in any city. So someone who is lucky enough the to... The incumbents are better. The incumbents are better. So if you happen to grow up in Manhattan and inherited a house from your parents, then great, that, that makes you lucky. And are you going to have a high level of consumption? Not because being inherited a house from your parents makes you wealthy, right? No, or not. No, it's, it's simply the, the right to live there uh, that makes you... Because in, I think that in Manhattan it's also because... Sure, yeah, yeah, then, then you also inherit all the things, I know. But uh, so here, all that, you, all that you basically get from your parents is sort of the right to live wherever they were living, right? So, yeah. without incurring this additional cost of regulation. So, anyone has the right to live there, but they need to get a house, and, and that's going to be expensive, more expensive the higher the regulation. Okay, so now we can think about growth in this context and think about population growth. So, this is the uh, population growth of CTI. Uh, over two periods, and then that's going to be a combination of the shock to the productivity of the city, human capital accumulation, and changes in this uh, uh, transportation uh, costs. Um, so just briefly, one of the things that we can do here is we can obtain um, a distribution of city sizes, something that is well known uh, as a regularity of urban systems, is that if you think about the distribution of city sizes, it's actually quite well approximated by a Pareto distribution with uh, a shape parameter close to one. Okay, so uh, if you think about it graphically, if you say rank all cities in a country, in this case the US, from biggest to smaller, and then you plot the log of the rank against the log of the size of population, so this one would be the rank of New York to the rank of LA and so on, then you get something 
that's not very far off a 45 degree line, right? That's the regularity we know. We also know, you know, from the work of, of Chabé Gabé and, and others, uh, that um, a way to get this kind of regularity in a model is to have all cities be subject to some random growth process where the mean and variance of those growth rates are not systematically related to the city size. So, fine, so we know that, right? But here, relative to the model of Gave or to other models that people have done based on his work, we have two complications. First, in those random growth models, typically city growth is just the result of, uh, of shocks, and you uh, typically don't worry about this component of uh, benefits and cost of bigger cities that the urban literature works in a different in different papers, right? So there's a, there's a bit of a of a uh, break here where a is on the one hand are thinking about papers with agglomeration and congestion, and on the other hand you get to this random growth models so that those components disappear, right? So it turns out you can bring it back in, and the reason why it doesn't matter to have this agglomeration and, and congestion cost is that you know although there's this trade-off you're getting these incumbents choosing regulation to balance that trade-off and set you at some point there, right? So in the end, you're operating at the maximum of these curves, right? And uh, so in, in the end, in equilibrium, this, your cities are operating at the point where agglomeration economies and crowding costs are going to balance out locally. Perhaps more, uh, you know, a bigger difficulty is the fact that in these random growth models, the only component driving city growth is typically random shocks. And here we also have systematic determinants of growth. In particular, think about human capital accumulation. Here, human capital accumulation is an important driver of growth. But human capital also tends to be bigger in bigger cities. That can create a problem. Why does it create a problem for us here? Well, because we have the levels of human capital different systematically across these different sizes. But in our model, we've written it down so that the growth rate of human capital is the same across cities of different sizes, right? So that works in terms of getting this realistic city size distributions. But is it, is it realistic in itself? Is it, is it a good assumption? Is it a good, a, a good component of the model? Um, well, you know, so one thing we've done here in terms of data is then to look at human capital levels across cities of different sizes. Here measured simply through the share of population with a college degree. And what you see is that, you know, here there's a red line for big cities, blue line for middle-sized cities, green line for smaller cities, metropolitan areas. And you can see that indeed, you know, there's more human capital per person in bigger cities. But this, you know, and it's been increasing everywhere over time, but it's been increasing at very similar rates. So in fact, if you divide the 2016 level by the 1986 level, you get like 1.67, 1.68, 1.67 in all three cases. If you look at the elasticity, if instead of splitting cities into groups, you look at the elasticity of human capital with respect to city size, you also get an elasticity that seems to be pretty, con pretty much a constant over time. Okay? So indeed, it seems to be the case that there are systematic differences in levels of human capital across cities in the US but not systematic differences in growth rates. Uh, and that is what, I, what we need in the model to get these realistic city size distributions. OK, so a um, couple of, you know, I still want to do three things. So let me, let me not, let, 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 me, let me try to do all three uh, uh, reasonably quickly, but hopefully still clearly enough. So first of all, one of the things we're going to do now is going to, we're going to take the model and we're going to use equations of the model to estimate the key parameters. So first key parameter that we have here in terms of, of the urban cost is this gamma. This gamma starts off in this equation as the density of distance traveled with respect to distance to the center. So first way to estimate this parameter is to get travel data from the NHCS travel survey in the US at the household level and see how much people travel depending on where they live in the city. So using that, we can estimate this elasticity. But then we saw that if you look at the within-city equilibrium, then an implication of the model is that in equilibrium, 
any increase in accessibility, any fall in transport costs as you move closer to the city center should be exactly offset by an increase in housing costs. So if instead of looking at transport data, you look at housing data and you estimate the elasticity of housing costs with respect to the sense of the center, you should get the same as elasticity, right? So that's a strong implication of the model and it's one we're also going to check. Then finally, you can get to the full equilibrium of the model. That's going to give us this equation that relates uh, the price of housing at the city center uh, uh, with respect to the physical extent of the city. And that gives us just a third way to estimate this gamma parameter. So then we estimate gamma in all three ways. First here with transport data at the household level, then here with housing data at the block group level, finally using the, uh, uh, the full generic of the model. Uh, and we get basically, you can see uh, almost exactly the same parameter estimate for gamma, which is 0.07, yeah. Sorry, isn't this a little bit surprising because you have the, 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 same, the same parameter with the three, uh, just, just because you have one type of consumer. Uh, if you have more than one type of consumer, everything change. And in, I think that in those cities, they are hosting a heterogeneous group of the consumer mm -hmm. with respect to wealth, for instance, which is quite important. So isn't it a little bit surprising to have such a same estimate for the, the three Yeah, um, I mean, partly, partly these things are going to probably balance out partly in, in aggregate. Partly, you know, we are controlling for, uh, you know, neighborhood and, 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 uh, and individual characteristics here, right? So we are controlling for things like, you know, uh, housing characteristics, we're controlling for school quality, we're controlling for lots of things, right? So. This is sort of the city that remains after you control for all of those uh, sources of heterogeneity within the city, right? So that's partly taking care of that. But if you took the price of land, yeah, uh, which is outside those things, uh, you would have the same type of predictions, and uh, it would depend only on the fact that we have one type of consumers, agents, right? But anyway. Yeah, so, so, I mean, here in the model, you basically have just one Bitcoin curve. In practice, you will have different <laughs> groups, so you will have different bit difference groups, and what you get is the upper envelope of those, exactly. right? So, uh, but still, you know, so... We could not estimate everything with the, what happened in the city center, yeah. because it's... Uh... Well, it, 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 yeah. E... Yeah, as I say, overall it, it seems to, to work uh, reasonably well, right? And in fact, you know, here we're just doing it for, for the US, right? Um, so there's some, there's some subtleties, right? So then if you look at these of different sizes, these grains may be slightly different, but overall it seems to be a reasonably good, good approximation, right? Yeah. And if you had a model with two types of uh, agents, how, how would, the, would we have a bias, an upward bias and a lower? The, so papers looking at, at that, I mean, they're not trying to do this really exactly, but, but papers looking at sorting within the city tend to, you know, one of the things they do is they look at the elasticity of the value of total time with respect to income and the elasticity of uh, demand for housing with respect to income, right? So uh, both those things are going to be exactly the sort of thing that you're talking about, right? So once you have multiple groups, they will differ in those two dimensions. The thing is those two things tend to offset each other. And in, in, in fact, when people see these things, they find similar values, right? So in fact, the, the, the empirical literature uh, hasn't reached any strong conclusion there because as you become wealthier, you value your travel time more, but you also tend to want to have bigger houses, right? And those things push in opposite direction, right? So they tend to cancel each other. I think that's, that's one of the reasons why this is still working uh, on aggregate, yeah. Um, 
Cox at Vigo and I asked where is the city center and people didn't know what I meant. Sure. No, so, so <laughs> yeah, the, uh, so different ways to do this. One way is the way you say ask people. So there was traditionally the US census used to do this. They used to ask people what the city center was. <clears throat> Um, another way to do it is to look at uh, a density and look for a peak in density, say building density or population density in the city. What we do here is rather than ask people, we ask Google. So we, we ask Google uh, basically what, you know, what it considers the center of the city. And it doesn't work everywhere in the world, but for the US, they seem to have spent quite a lot of time thinking about this. And if you ask people in the city, then the question that you asked when you were in San Diego, the, the answer they tend to give you, or if you know cities, it actually tends to be quite, quite close, if not exactly what, what Google gives you, right? So that's what we work with. But, but yeah, you can also take this older data from the US census in terms of asking locals and actually asking uh, uh, firms uh, what they consider the center of the city, or you can have these this peaks, and, and they, they, they don't give very different answers, yeah. But yeah, essentially what we do is ask Google. So that's, that's the city centers that we're doing here. <coughs> yes, uh, with, with colleagues, we, uh, we regress the expenditure, the uh, transportation expenditure on a day-by-day -day, uh, basis uh, <coughs> on exactly the, the distance to city center mm -hmm. of the metropolitan area in France. And <coughs> we obtain strikes, uh, quite the same similar value, okay. point, uh, zero 0.06. Ah. So it is not in terms of distance, because you don't have the distance, but in terms of expenditure. Mm. Uh, so it is a car expenditure, and plus uh, <coughs> metro, and so on. But we obtain more or less the same value. That's very interesting. Yes, I'll to, if you don't mind, email me the, the, the work. I'll begin be to read it. OK. Thanks very much. Okay, so that was one, one key parameter here. Another key parameter is this congestion parameter. So this is basically the elasticity of travel speed with respect to city size. Uh, we do it with the survey data, the NHCS. Of course, when you have travel surveys, sometimes the problem is that people tend to round numbers. So they, they, don't, they typically don't say, I took 17 minutes to get to my office. They say, I took 15 minutes, or I took 20, whatever, right? So what you can do is you can take the uh, the trip they made, and you can again go to Google and ask Google, so on this day of the week, at that time, how long does it take to go from this place to that place? Actually, you get exactly the same, the same kind of velocity. Okay. Um, then on the, on the benefit side, uh, I can get this to respond. Okay, so on the benefit side, basically there, what we do is a bit more standard. Uh, in fact, we, we replicate uh, what I mentioned before, this work with Jorge La Roca that we did for Spain, here we do for the US. So we regress earnings at the worker level on a worker fixed effect, a city fixed effect, allowing for the value of experience to differ across cities of different sizes. And that gives us some estimate for the short term benefits of being in a city, but also incorporating this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, extra value of early of experience as well. Okay, so then. Um, so uh, now we have the model, we have these parameter estimates. Before we use those parameter estimates to do some counterfactuals, it's worth noting that the model we have has many implications that are standard in urban models. So this is actually empirics. This is plotting some gradients of monthly rents as a function of distance to the center. Uh, controlling, you know, after taking out different housing characteristics and so on, uh, for five cities in the US. So our model, like this data, like most urban models, has typically more expensive housing in the center of bigger cities. It has a gradient of house prices, where housing rents in this case, where they fall as you move away from the center. Bigger cities in population also tend to be bigger in terms of physical size. All of those things are fairly standard. One thing that is different in our model with respect to standard urban models is that in standard urban models, when you look not at the center of the city but at the edge of the city, you would expect house prices or housing rents at the edge to be mostly equalized. Because in a standard model, the cost of housing at the edge of a city 
is going to be the cost of land in the best alternative use, say agriculture, which is going to be fairly homogenous across the US, plus construction costs, which are also very similar. Our model says, no, in addition to land and the cost of construction, you will also have regulation. And the model predicts that incumbents in more populated cities are going to set tougher regulation. So given that the cost of regulation is higher in bigger cities, you expect the cost of housing at the edge of cities to also be bigger. That's what you see for these five cities in the US. If instead of just focusing on these five, you look at all of them, you see that indeed there's a positive relationship between housing rents at the periphery of cities and city population. The model says this is because regulation is systematically stricter in bigger cities. Is that the case? Well, this next plot uh, shows the strictness of planning regulation as measured by this Wharton Index of Regulation, which is from a survey where they call different local agencies and they ask them about different planning rules that they have. If you relate that to city population, you see that indeed in the US, regulation seems to be systematically stricter in bigger cities. Now, the model, in fact, is a bit more sophisticated than this because it not just, doesn't just say that regulation is related to the population. It tells you that geography also matters. And a priori, you know, if you, if you don't have the model, or if you just think about this loosely, one thing one might expect is that maybe sort of natural scarcity coming from geography and artificial scarcity coming from regulation, you might think of them as as substitutes, right? You might think, well, if the city is already very constrained by geography, maybe I don't need to regulate as much. But the model says, no, these incumbents are setting regulation to balance off these benefits and costs from bigger cities. And a city that's more geographically constrained is going to be a city where an extra person brings more congestion. So you also want to have stricter regulation in places that are more geographically constrained. So just, just you expect this positive association between geographical constraints and planning regulations. And in fact, this is what this plot shows. So this measures what percentage of the fringe of the city, so the, the space that's immediately before was already intensely built, what part of that is constrained from development by being covered by water, land seeking <coughs> of 50%, uh, federal parks, those sort of things. And you can see that indeed there's this uh, positive association between uh, the natural scarcity and the artificial scarcity. Finally, um, you know, you, you, yes. Uh, no, so let's see if this goes back enough. So, so the 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 P is going to be increasing population and increasing also in the geographical constraints. Okay, and it's because yeah, an extra person gives extra congestion in a city that's more geographically constrained. Okay, so then, you know, uh, finally, um, I guess this, this goes back to something that Tengi was uh, asking before, you know, whether we can uh, um, then back out uh, this, the, the, the cost of this from, from, from the data. Um, so what we've done here is we, given that we're saying that this regulation creates this, this extra wet at the, at the edge of the cities, we can go and quantify that, right? So what we've done here is we've, we're comparing the price of a house at the edge of different US cities with the replacement cost for that house. Now, when you calculate that replacement cost, you cannot go and look at what is the price of the plot of land where the house is built, because regulation makes it legal to build in some places and not in other places. So the plot of land already incorporates in its price the cost of regulation. So what you need to buy, find is another plot of land close by that's used for agriculture and see what's the price of that. So that's what we've done. We've looked at the edge of all of your cities. We've looked at land transactions for agricultural land nearby. And we've seen what, are the, what is the, the price of the plot of land 
the size of the one that you use for the house. Then we also get construction costs, and we get this from a firm that provides software for construction firms to do their budgeting. Uh, so these are also city-specific. So with that, we can create a city-specific cost of a house at the end of the city with the price of land, if it was used for agriculture, plus construction cost. And we compare that with the cost of the built housing there. And you can see, again, there's this positive association with regulation, and it's actually very big, right? So in places like San Francisco, San Diego, you're actually talking about a half a million dollar difference between the price of a house and what it would cost to replace that house, simply in terms of the price of the land and, uh, and construction. Uh, so I'm out of time. Let me, can, can I spend just two minutes uh, doing a quick counterfactual here? Uh, yeah. So um, we do a number of counterfactuals with the model. One of the ones that we do is we think about the uh, implications of regulation, right? So what would happen if we relax regulation in US cities? So for this, we're going to target seven large cities with population larger than 3 million that have this wedge between house prices and replacement costs greater than 200,000. So these are New York, LA, San Francisco, uh, Washington DC, Boston, San Diego, and Seattle. And what we're going to do is we're going to counterfactually have the cities make it easier to build by having the permits of the issue go up to be at the 75 percentile of the US distribution across all cities. And when we do that, we find that this involves significant increases in the size of the cities. Right? So New York, for instance, goes from 20 to 27 million. It means big changes in nominal income of close to 8 uh, percent on average. However, the net increases are smaller because when you make one of the cities bigger, you also make it more congested, right? So there, the, uh, the average increase in income uh, per person, uh, net of this congestion is about 2%. And it's also going to be something that reduces inequalities by reducing the gap between incumbents and newcomers in different cities substantially. Okay, so that's one of the exercises we do. We also do other exercises looking at what are the implications of cities for aggregate growth, how much do they matter, and, and those sort of things, right? But I'm out of time, so let me, let me stop here. Thank you. Maybe one question. Uh, you didn't uh, introduce public trans trans transportation in the model. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you find, because in the monocentric uh, model, mm -hmm. uh, when you introduce public transportation, generally it means that the gradient <coughs> So the slope of the of the price uh, uh, will be uh, it will be flatter. Mm -hmm. uh, do you find uh, this, uh, this uh, in your simulation? Um, so because in New York it seems that at the beginning, <coughs> the starting uh, it is still uh, so the slope is quite high in New York, but still uh, there is a. <coughs> A metro system, which is uh, which is not the case, for example, maybe for, I don't know, but uh, maybe in Houston, maybe it will yeah. be not. So, I does think, it? Yeah. So, so, so you know, that, 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 that's a very interesting question. I think here there are two two aspects that are driving this. One, I think, is, is what you are emphasizing, which I think is very relevant, which is the uh, transport technology or the transport uh, system that you have in different parts. The fact that in some cities in the US you have a good transport system and that might be more, you know, more, more dense in terms of the network downtown. At the same time, older historical city centers will also have more constraints in terms of listed buildings that you cannot uh, build up, things like that, right? So in fact, something that you see here is that, uh, you know, here you have New York, Chicago. So the centers of historical cities in the US do tend to get this sort of steeper profile very close to the center. If you look at Boston, it's very similar. Many of these historical cities look like that. Whereas newer cities that are already built around the car to start with, they tend to have like this, this kind of flatter, flatter gradients, right? But it's, it's not something we've explored systematically. Just from, the, from doing examples for this, for this picture, that's the sort of pattern that we tend to find. And my, my guess, it's a combination of, as you say, the transport system, plus this 
constraints in terms of historical buildings and streets being narrow because they were built around the streetcar and walking, whereas in newer cities they're built around cars already with four lanes, six lanes, whatever, right? Yes. Okay. Could, could go for 300 kilometers, why not you know, 500 at some point? So where do you, how do you um, cut the line? Okay, so uh, here um, we um, look at the definition of metropolitan areas in the US. Now, because that is based on counties which differ in size, what we do is we first, we put two constraints. First, the first constraint is for all housing units in a metropolitan area we constrain it to be not beyond the 95 percentile because you can have a city that has just a few scattered houses that are very far away. And then a second, we also, if I recall correctly, what we do um, is we, um, we ask for some sort of contiguity, right? So you don't, you don't go, so you don't have like a city and then a gap and then something that, that, is, that is very far away, right? So we are, I mean, ideally, I think, uh, one might want to do like your own definitions of cities where you have like, you know, contiguity and you, you allow for some margins in terms of what is the biggest gap that you want, what is the minimum density. Uh, here, we didn't want to do that partly because also, you know, we, we didn't want to do something that was too ad hoc, so it would seem like we had done it on purpose to get some results or something like that. So we just started with the official definitions and then just put these constraints of not have houses that are too far away and isolated and having this constraint uh, in terms of contiguity to the city center, and that's, that's what we do. Yeah. All right. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Diego. And Diego will be with us uh, part of the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much.